Hello and welcome to the programme. Well, with most of us hardly able to leave our own lands, that is just what we're doing here on this programme. The downside, it is virtual and it is COVID-related. As the Delta variant spreads across Europe, we're off to Portugal, Russia, France and back here to the UK to see who's got it right or wrong in fighting coronavirus. Good to have your company. I'm David Foster. So the UK is pretty much lifting all restrictions except travel, even as cases rocket. That's put down to a successful vaccination programme. In the European Union, there is criticism of a slow vaccine rollout. And in Russia, millions just don't want a vaccine at all. Has anyone got the right idea? <laughs> As the Delta variant of COVID-19 spreads, European countries are in a race to vaccinate their populations. Russia was the first country to approve a vaccine, Sputnik V. But recently, it's seen more than 700 deaths every day, with 93% of cases caused by the Delta variant. In the UK, Delta accounts for 98% of new cases, while in Portugal, it's 74%. First detected in India last year, the variant is now present in more than 100 countries. It's estimated to be between 40 to 60 percent more transmissible than the Alpha variant. While the number of vaccinated Europeans increases, millions are yet to have a dose there and around the world. According to the head of the World Health Organization, the Delta variant is dangerous and is continuing to evolve and mutate. The WHO predicts that it will account for most cases in Europe by August. Will Europe's vaccination programs catch up or could the Delta variant outrun them? Well, we're doing things a little bit differently today. We will hear separately from the UK, from Russia, France and from Portugal. So, first to England, joining us from Lancaster, I'm pleased to say Dr. Mohamed Munir, a virologist at Lancaster University. Mohamed, good to have you on the programme. I know you're also a member of the expert team of the World Health Organisation, and we will talk about that a little bit later when I come to preparedness for any future pandemic. But let me read out some figures uh, from the UK. We will do this with each country as we come to them. Uh, in the United Kingdom, the number of people fully vaccinated 34 million, that's 51% of the population. Daily COVID-19 cases, 32,548. These are all as of the 8th of July. Mohammed, since we're talking about the Delta variant being the most dangerous, the most transmissible at the moment, I wonder if there's anything we should be doing in the UK that we haven't done already? I think um, the important thing at the moment in terms of the virus spread is really to look onto the Delta variant and also the vaccine coverage. So Delta variant has got some of those critical mutations that are making it very transmissible, vaccine, vaccine escaping, and, um, and probably um, covering those uh, cohort of the population, those are unvaccinated and or the younger age. So overall changing the paradigm of the of the pandemic as it stands. In the UK, I think overall we've been doing an incredible job in terms of vaccine rollout, in terms of deployment of the vaccine to the, to the population where we can get closer to the herd immunity. But what we have been lacking um, until now is to act at the timely manner, at the time when there is a critical situation to control this pandemic and to be very uh, quick in opening up because if you're not timely opening and if you are opening up at the stage when the variants are emerging and when we have a massive number of cases per day, that is really the mistake that we should not... So, not so I, I'm wondering what you think when you see, other than perhaps um, you're happy about uh, the fact that football's on the television and England have been doing uh, pretty well, I wonder what you think when you see thousands and thousands of people gather together when we know that in the UK one of the biggest causes of the first 
uh, outbreak was the, the massive sporting occasion was the Cheltenham Festival um, in early spring of last year. Well, absolutely. Whenever I see a uh, gathering in the sports event at that particular stage when the, the pandemic is at a full flag, I see them as a factory dishes for the viruses because that is the ideal environment for the virus to jump from one person to another person, which each individual have its own anatomy, its own physiology. That is the fertile environment for the virus to mutate and mutate at the scale which we would be very hard to catch up uh, at that level. And I think uh, the, the important thing here is that there are many other variants. In, in the WHO list, there are more mm. than 20 different variants that, that are being looked into. And if we are not going to pick them at the right time, basically we are giving this virus to f uh, flourish in, at the scale which will be very difficult to control later. And these sporting events are really the fertile yeah, environment. I, I've heard it referred to as a petri dish, the sort of thing that you grow cultures on in a laboratory, uh, that the UK is one large experiment. I'd like to hear now ab about the different viewpoints from um, Keir Starmer, leader of the UK Labour Party, the, the opposition, and the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. We all want restrictions lifted, we want our economy open, and we want to get back to normal. But we've been here too many times before. Isn't it the case that, once again, instead of a careful, controlled approach, yeah. we're heading for a summer of chaos and confusion? Yeah. Minister. Uh, no, Mr. Speaker, is the answer to that. Uh, and uh, these are, of course, these are these are difficult decisions. They need to be taken in a in a balanced way, and that's what we're doing. And uh, throughout the pandemic, uh, to do all these things, uh, frankly, Mr. Speaker, takes a great deal of drive, and it takes a great deal of leadership to get things done. So what Keir Starmer is saying there, Mohammed, is instead of a careful, controlled approach, we're heading for a summer of chaos and confusion. Um, is that right? No, not that is not really backed up by any of the scientific data, and particularly at this stage when we are having a massive number of new cases. I think what we are missing here is that we have a very good uh, vaccine rollout uh, scheme from the beginning. We have almost half of the population vaccinated, but that also means that we have to scale up the vaccination scale at the level where we have the herd immunity. And if we open up before that, that means we are really giving the chance to Delta variant to spread quite lavishly and to cause a debilitating long-term long COVID effect. And we know one in 10 uh, people infected with the COVID-19 are going to have a long COVID, which means that if 100,000 people are infected, as the government is saying, uh, per day at the end of this month, meaning that we will be having 10,000 cases of long COVID every day. And if that you multiply for the next couple of months, basically we are putting um, uh, an extra pressure of um, the, the disease that we can prevent that onto our healthcare sectors. The battle is far from over. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Mohammed Munir. I'm delighted to say we can go to Russia now. Uh, we see there Vasily Vlasov, professor at the Department of Healthcare at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow. Vasily, good to have you with us. These are the figures I've got for Russia. Fully vaccinated, 18.4 million. That's 12.7% of the population compared to the UK's 51%. And daily COVID-19 cases, 24,818 as of the 8th of July. I'm going to start with this question. Why are so many people in Russia apparently reluctant to get vaccinated? I believe that uh, so many people are hesitating because uh, the registration of the vaccine was formally announced uh, in, uh, in August uh, 2020. And uh, really, a vaccine became available only in January. And uh, all this time, uh, the press was filled uh, with advertisements about how wonderful this vaccine is. And in the same time, with information about how ugly and dangerous are Western vaccines. So uh, this uh, mixed uh, uh, message uh, obviously uh, harms uh, the uh, desire of people to be vaccinated. OK, uh, but my, uh, my follow-up question to this is, if only a quarter of the number of or percentage of people in Russia have been vaccinated compared to the UK, how is it that the daily COVID-19 cases are still so low comparatively? 32,000 in the UK, 24,000 a day um, in, in Russia, and yet hardly anybody's had the vaccine. Why? Uh, please don't, don't trust propaganda. It is well known that uh, Russian official numbers, which are reflected on the informational websites, are uh, 
not uh, accurate. Uh, not accurate. Uh, what we know from uh, 2020, uh, Russia was one of the most suffering countries in the world. Uh, uh, the excess death number uh, was about uh, 400,000 uh, people. It's, that's a lot. And uh, probably uh, now uh, picture is not as uh, blissful as uh, you described. Uh, we know, for example, that in uh, many cities, hospitals are full or near to full. And uh, a week ago, uh, the Federal Ministry of uh, Industry and Trade actually uh, published a call to uh, the uh, metal uh, production industry to reduce the consumption of oxygen to have more oxygen for Russian hospitals. It, it is something, something strange. Okay. Uh, something so we shouldn't believe the figures that we get. Yeah. It's, it's on the rise and the Delta variant particularly on, on the rise, I understand, because of, in your opinion, the lifting of restrictions. What were those restrictions and, and why, did it, why was it wrong to lift them? Uh, because uh, uh, all tradition of the many uh, states, including the Russian state, is to uh, present the uh, beautiful picture of uh, the uh, government actions and about the beauty of living in such a country. Uh, Russia is just an example of that. Uh, and so we, uh, as epidemiologists and analytics, we don't uh, trust uh, blindly to uh, these uh, to these numbers. So, so uh, what were Russians barred from doing, prevented from doing, that they can now do? What restrictions were there, and what have been lifted? I think that uh, the cause why we think that uh, the number of cases and deaths is high now, high now. Uh, is it because we have the information about the number of deaths and we know uh, that uh, 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 hospitals are uh, over overloaded? It is, it is why we think that uh, we have to not underestimate the, the picture. Uh, so you, is it that... your opinion, Vasily, that the worst is yet to come in Russia? Uh, yes. Uh, in, uh, I believe that uh, the wave uh, of uh, COVID, which started in May, I think slowly, now it is uh, at its height, and it probably for uh, next uh, months to go. Vasily Vlasov, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Well, time for us to go to Geneva. And then we see Antoine Flao, director of the Institute of Global Health at the University of Geneva. Antoine, I know you have some Europe-wide opinions. We're going to be talking mainly with you about France. So here are some figures from France. Numbers vaccinated, 23 million. Uh, that is 34% of the population. Daily COVID-19 cases as of the 8th of July are just under 4,100, 4,083. Now, that's a very low number compared to the UK, um, compared to Russia, where we heard from Vasily that we shouldn't believe the official figures. Anyway, so, so first of all, where do you think France has got some things right and where perhaps has it got some wrong? In fact, France, as most of the European countries, uh, has chosen a, a mitigation strategy, meaning that uh, they acted uh, when to avoid overwhelming of the healthcare system, exactly as in the UK. You, you remember that Boris Johnson, the 4th of January, decided to lock down uh, your country because uh, of a risk of overwhelming, which was uh, a signal sent by the NHS. Uh, same, similar for figure for, for France. It's only when uh, there is a risk of... Uh, Yes, of overwhelming uh, the intensive care units that uh, the President Macron decides to lock down. And he decided to lock down uh, in uh, April and May, and with, uh, it was very successful. The incidents uh, went down, exactly as in the UK before April, and uh, now it's low tide. In fact, we can see some early signals of... Um, Re-emergence, I would say, of, of growing up. There is a rise in, in the curve, the, the R, the effective reproductive rate is no longer below one. So uh, as 
uh, for the other European countries, we can foresee that what you are seeing in the UK will come soon. So in, is in it France. very much a case of, as Boris Johnson, since you referenced the United Kingdom, as the UK Prime Minister uh, said, if we don't open up now, when will we ever open up? Because this is the best time to do it. Hospitals can cope. We haven't got the cold weather, et cetera, et cetera. It's only going to get worse and worse. And we've got to hope by then that we can handle it. All of us in, in continental Europe, we are really uh, watching what is happening in the UK and in Portugal uh, to see to what extent we can follow the same approach. Uh, many of us, uh, I am an epidemiologist and not a politician, but many of us among the epidemiologists and scientists do believe that it is a very risky uh, approach and attitude. It's just betting that uh, they will not have, you will not experience a wave in, um, in the healthcare system, in hospitalization, in complication and death, uh, which is not completely for granted. Uh, we can uh, also uh, make the hypothesis of a more pessimistic scenario where uh, there is just a lag between the grow in uh, cases and the grow in, um, in hospitalization. Yes. Uh, maybe you just have a small percentage of unvaccinated people, which is bigger in France, for instance, or in Portugal. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask you may... about vaccinations in just a moment, if I may. But to back up your point about watching the UK, among other countries, let's... Um... Let me read out what Gabriel Attal, a government spokesman, had to say. This variant is dangerous and quick, and wherever it is present, it can ruin the summer. We are getting more and more warning signals. You've mentioned those. More and more warning signals, and we could see the same trajectory as in some neighbouring countries. So the, the official are very much aware of what possibly could happen, but it's the vaccinations I want to get to. 34% probably going up a little bit by the time uh, people are watching this. But that's still relatively low. Does it need to be much higher for France to be able to battle this Delta variant? Yes, you make a good point. It's sure that 34% uh, is much too low to prevent any, any wave uh, and maybe to prevent a similar wave as... Uh, Russia is currently knowing. So uh, even if Russia is still lower than France in terms of uh, vaccine coverage. Uh -huh. so, uh, so can I just I, say this? Ha have the French people and indeed other European uh, Commission countries have been failed by their governments? Because on this programme three months ago, you said you hoped by the 14th of July that pretty much everybody, around about 70% of the population in Europe would be vaccinated. That was the promise. Have people been let down? Yes, you have to add to this 34%, 17% of people who have received only one dose, and they will receive the second dose very soon. So probably we are closer to 50%. And uh, the, the point is that uh, there is a slowdown in the process of vaccination, which is not the cause of the government, or at least not the direct cause of the government. So they are looking now in France, but also in Switzerland or in other countries, to how to uh, proceed to uh, improve a bit more this coverage, because everyone knows that even 70% is not enough, probably more than 80. You, you, you show that it is not enough, I would say, and even Israel show that we need some very, very high figures if we want to uh, reach uh, any kind of herd immunity. So probably uh, there is some discussions today, currently, I mean, in France about uh, making mandatory uh, the vaccination, at least for healthcare workers and maybe for all the population. So okay. it's something which is uh, probably under investigation how to improve that much, much quickly. Antoine, much Antoine Flo, we have to end it there. Thank you very, very much indeed. Joining us now from Sintra in Portugal, Ricardo Leite, member of the Portuguese Parliament, head of public health at the Catholic University of Portugal and a medical doctor trained in infectious diseases. The figures from Portugal, uh, Ricardo, numbers vaccinated 3.9 million, that's 38% of the population, daily cases 
3,285. Um, does Portugal believe that it's actually got off relatively well during the course of this pandemic? Unfortunately, people have died, but not on the scale in, as in other countries. When we look at the numbers, you know, we've seen that we've lost over 17,000 people since the beginning of this pandemic about a year and a half ago. And many of those deaths were avoidable. So naturally, we should have done more as a country, as a European Union and globally to have early detected, prevented and reacted better to the pandemic. But most importantly at this point is to look at the numbers, as you mentioned, and try to understand what we can do now and moving forward to avoid as many deaths as possible at the same time that we are keep capable of making the, the fine balance work between uh, keeping lives in safety and making sure that our uh, economic value is maintained. And that is a very difficult balance, as you can imagine. But if we look at the numbers right now, fortunately, at uh, over uh, 3,000 cases a day, we see that the number of deaths are uh, significantly lower than when we had exactly the same number of cases in the past. And, so, and how has Portugal managed that? So undoubtedly, speaking with all of the specialists and looking at the numbers, it's vaccination that's been working. The truth is there have been some restrictive measures, but there is a firm belief from specialists across the board that vaccination is already playing a very important role. Mind you that we are vaccinating based on population age, so the most vulnerable population has been already fully vaccinated. And hopefully moving forward, we have just stepped up the pace of vaccination over the last couple of weeks in our country. And so there is an, a, a legitimate uh, um, uh, will and expectancy from everyone that we will reach September with uh, around 80% of the adult population vaccinated. You, you, you will tell me about the restrictions that uh, you already have, but I know that a, a nighttime curfew has recently been introduced. There are restrictive measures in Portugal. Do you think there will have to be more of those? To be honest, the restrictive measures that currently exist include nighttime curfew, limited hour times in restaurants, um, certain areas of the country have restrict restrictions of movement to come in and to leave. But if we look at the, those, those measures uh, objectively, they really don't have any impact. Uh, the only thing that is working is vaccination. And the, the issue here, here is, of course, with a strict lockdown, you would stop transmission because you'd have less people being able to be infected. And that would, of course, cease um, the evolution uh, that we are currently seeing of the numbers. The issue here is how do we manage to survive looking at, first of all, all of the non-COVID patients that are being left behind because of COVID? And on the other hand, how do we make sure that our economy continues to work? And we have seen that, you know, June and July have already been lost. Our economy depends deeply on tourism, mainly from the UK and Germany. And those countries and tourists from those countries are basically not coming to Portugal given the COVID situation. Well, can, can I so, ask you this? Can I ask you this? I, I know the economy comes into it and the Algarve in particular, very few cases down there and yet very few people as well in terms of tourism. Are there other countries you look at enviously, if you like, and think if only we had adopted their policies? Because on the one hand, you've perhaps got um, the Far Eastern countries, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, New Zealand, massive lockdowns, and yet you say it's rather cosmetic to have a lockdown. Who do you look at and think they got it right? Maybe we should have done the same. Nobody has it perfect because we're all learning, and especially when, when the pandemic hit last March in 2020. Uh, we clearly uh, were far behind in terms of the preparation needed. But when I look at the European level, not to mention the countries that you mentioned, when I look at Denmark, for example, since mid-April, they were capable of implementing a very uh, systematic testing scheme across the country, making sure that tracing was working so that they could quickly identify and isolate cases in the country, making sure that small uh, regional lockdowns when necessary were put in place, making sure that the country as a whole kept working and kept open, that schools could continue to work. I'm, I, and, you know, being a country like my own here in Portugal with one single land border surrounded by sea, just like Denmark, 
I believe that we have seen that it is possible with testing, tracing, and isolating, it is possible to avoid losing control of the pandemic, especially now that we have a uh, vaccination tool, hoping that new variants will not come about. So the combination of continuing to vaccinate at the same time as we continue to deal with this virus as we used to in the past, understanding that testing has such an important role to play, we can actually make sure that we control the pandemic, keep that RT below one, and avoid that we see this kind of escalation that sadly the Delta variant has been uh, demonstrating across, across many countries, including yeah. Portugal. Well, it isn't over. Thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, Ricardo Late, we appreciate you joining us from Portugal. Also, thank Mohamed, you. thank you very much for being with us here on Roundtable. Vasily and Antoine, we thank you for joining us from the UK, from Russia and from Geneva. Thank you wherever you happen to be for watching this edition of Roundtable. We've been on our travels. We hope you can join us next time. Until then, from me, David Foster and the Roundtable team. Goodbye.